Hello and welcome to Whiskey Uncorked. My name is Brian and today we are switching things up a little bit. We'll be reviewing our first non-scotch whiskey. It is still a single malt. But today we're going to look at a distillery exclusive from Stranahan's in Denver, Colorado. And this one has an interesting twist. So as you may be able to tell, this is a smaller bottle. This is 375 milliliters. And this is, as I mentioned, a distillery exclusive. I lived in the Denver area for about two and a half years before moving to San Diego and definitely made it a point to visit Stranahan's on a somewhat regular basis. We were there a few times and always tried to pick up one of their distillery exclusive bottles that comes in a 375 milliliter bottle. And on the, on the front, on the label, it doesn't really tell you exactly what you're getting. You've got to kind of take a look at uh, the the tag that is attached, but let me tell you exactly what we're drinking and then I'll give you a little bit more information here. So being a distillery exclusive is not in the entire story. Uh, it also says that this is a distiller's experimental series and this is generally what I always saw there. There was some version of this experimental series where they would have some sort of interesting cask most of the time, sometimes a very obscure cask. I saw like Isla, Scotch whiskey cask, that sort of thing. And this one is a little bit different. This one isn't about the cask really at all. To clarify, this is a batch four of the experimental series. The barrel fill date was March 17th, 2014. It is coming in at 55.45% ABV. This is bottle 542 of 550. And the barrel number on this is 14-07, excuse me, the barrel cask number is 14 0475. So that doesn't really tell you too much about the whiskey other than its ABV and its fill date, where you could maybe approximate the age. Let's take a look at what's in the tag. So I'll try to put a picture of this so you can see it if I, re if I remember. Um, but you get a little bit more information. Now it tells you that this is a seven year and one month old whiskey, which is a pretty good age for an American single malt and that the cask type is standard char number three. Nothing super special about this. Many American single malts are aged in new heavily charred oak, and this is just number three. It generally goes up to number four, which is alligator char. There's also toast levels and that sort of thing, but this is a pretty standard American barrel. To find out what really makes this bottle unique, at least, is you have to read uh, this little tasting note section here, and it says, we swapped out our proprietary yeast strain for a brewing industry standard, San Diego Super Yeast. As opposed to our balanced low and slow fermentations, this West Coast Classic ferments very quickly. This leads to a completely different ester profile with bright notes of apple and spun sugar. Combined with hefty thyme and oak, this whiskey has a uniquely satisfying and fruity finish. So, this is all about the yeast, really. Um, obviously, the barrel uh, is part of the equation here. Um, they do use reused barrels. They have a number of, they have a Solera system, which I think is their Blue Peak uh, bottling. Um, so they do a lot of experimentation. Obviously, as I've mentioned, there's a number of different casts that I've seen these uh, distillery exclusive experimental series bottlings aged in. And that's why I kind of decided to do this. Now, this is technically a last drops review. There's very little left in this bottle, um, was debating whether I was gonna bother reviewing something like this because there's almost no chance that you're gonna be able to go out and get it. I'm sure this isn't st still for sale uh, at, the, at the distillery as this was purchased a couple years back. However, I felt that because of the use of this interesting yeast, it really shone a light on the evolution of the American single malt category. There is no doubt that the American single malt category, at least here in the States, I don't know how much of it is actually being exported. I know Balconis is sometimes available uh, because they were, they partnered up with, I think it was Diageo actually, um, to help with the distribution and everything. So, so I know that their bottles are available outside of the States, at least to some degree. But here in the States, there has been a pretty significant increase in the interest around American single malts. They have been a thing that has been slowly up and coming for quite a while now. Stranahan's has been around a pretty long time. They, uh, they do actually have a 10-year-old release, which I do have a bottle of. I will be 
reviewing that at some point here. And given some of the interesting qualities of this that pretty clearly have come out of the use of the San Diego Super Yeast. Yes, I am in San Diego. It's not why I moved here. I didn't taste this and say I have to move to San Diego immediately because they have the best yeast. Definitely didn't do that. But uh, it definitely has an obvious impact on the whiskey. And it's one that I think by the time I got down into this bottle and I started to figure it out, I actually really started to enjoy it. All right, well, let's get this thing poured and let's do a review. And I'll talk a little bit more about just my personal experience with Stranahan's American Single Malts and get you on your way. But there isn't much left. I don't think it's always hard to tell, but I think this is going to be a pretty small pour. Yeah. All right. I did not pour myself a two ounce sample of this. I do have a number of bottles like this. They also have an event called the Cask Thief, uh, which is where I caught COVID the one time. <laughs> I know that I had COVID. I'm like 99% sure I got it from there. But I do actually have a number of other bottles like this where they basically take the whiskey right out of the cask uh, and they put it into the bottle where you can go around and taste it. They'll pour right into your glass and then you can buy uh, a bottle of it. When I first opened this bottle, it was kind of strange. It was another one of these. This happens a lot. If you haven't noticed, uh, sometimes you get a bottle of the whiskey's doing something a little bit different, a little bit different cask influence um, or a different style from a distillery. It can kind of take you a minute to wrap your head around it, get your palate adjusted, let the whiskey open up a little bit. But I can definitely say the last few pours that I've had out of this bottle have actually been pretty tasty. But let's, as always, see what I'm getting today. So there is a note that is pretty unmistakably American single malt to me. I do even sometimes get it like on like Texas bourbons, like warm weather, hot weather bourbons. And it's always been a little bit difficult for me to describe. It's it's a bit of a kind of it's a slightly like a cleaner sort of note. It's 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 soft, it's not sharp. Um, I think when I first noticed it, I kind of thought that it was like a melted butter, but it's a pretty distinct note that I get in a lot of American single malts, particularly ones that are aged in new oak so that is definitely in here but it's not super dense like sometimes it's a little bit much and it can be almost off-putting but here it's a nice balance it's not a problem there are there's a there's a darker caramel almost like maybe like a toffee there's like what in my mind I pick I think of like an iced tea like a just a brown tea it's not necessarily like a black tea like herbal but I just just like a, a, a bottle of like Lipton's tea there is some vanilla which isn't surprising given the new the new oak the label said green apples and sponge sugar I'm not picking that up too much on the nose so although I'm not getting the apple I am definitely getting like that, like the the crystallized sugar, like on the top of a creme brulee or something like that. Like there is definitely uh, like a glassy sugar smell. There might be a little bit of citrus. Like I said, that there's that there's that iced tea with like a maybe a, a lemon slice or something like that. But it's pretty pleasant. As I, this is a last drops review. I haven't previously done any notes or anything for this, but I do actually like the nose quite a bit. There are some layers there. There's actually quite a few subtleties here. It's not like wow, but it's interesting enough and it's definitely got uh, some different notes. I don't know if I've ever really called out just like a like an iced tea with lemon before on any whiskey. But yeah, I do actually enjoy it quite a bit. It is different. It's a little off the beaten path for myself, but I'm actually digging it quite a bit. Now let's see how it is on the palate. Cheers. So I can say overall, it is quite fruity on the palate. I wasn't picking up a whole lot on the nose, but there is a pretty distinct fruitiness. There's a hint of that really nice, like tropical stone fruity juiciness that I get on like bourbon barrel aged scotch. One of my favorite flavors i've talked about it many times uh, if you're looking for a uh, an example of a whiskey that will have some of that on it uh, the aaron 10 has a little bit of it on it uh, the new injury trini is another one that i get some of that on and then 
uh, particular as, as whiskeys get older, it can kind of tend to intensify. And then like Ben Nevis, when Ben Nevis gets a little old, you can get that real nice kind of dirty tropical stone fruit flavor that I absolutely love. So there is a touch of that on here. Um, it was a little spicy <laughs> for the ABV being about 55%. Shouldn't really be, I think it's probably mostly just a palette right now. But yeah, let's take a second sip and see if I can pull anything else out of here. We are getting some caramels and vanillas up front. There's a spiciness here. There's an oaky spice. Not quite bitter, but some pretty distinct oak notes. It's obviously pretty malty. Uh, again, that that distinct quality on the nose does translate to a, a kind of maltiness on the palate where it's, I would say it's like a little bit denser than maybe like a your run of the mill Scotch single malt. It definitely feels like it has a little bit more heft to it. Um, a little bit more nougat-y. It's got a nice finish, although I do think I'm getting a little bit more bitter tonight than I normally do on it. Um, it's not necessarily a turn off, but it, it, like I said, the oak is coming out quite a bit today. Let's do one more sip and finish up the review. We'll give it a score um, for the fun of it and talk a little bit more about American single malts. Cheers. Mm, a little more chocolate coming out that time. Mm, there it is. Not quite as fruity as it was maybe the last couple uh, drams that I had it, but still there, still can catch a hint of it. Real full, nice mouthfeel. Uh, again, nice finish. Not quite as bitter that sip. I think my palate's getting a little bit more adjusted. Mm. But it's actually pretty tasty. First score, this one, interesting. Difficult to, I've had, this is another one bottle that I think has changed a lot. Only having the 375 milliliter bottle makes it a little tough to like really get to know it, especially being that this is essentially a last drops review. But man, I'm enjoying this one quite a bit. I kind of wish I had some more to continue to get to know it. Didn't buy a second one of these. Again, when you're buying these kind of experimental things, you're taking a shot in the dark just to see how it turned out, just like the distillery did. So with that, I'm tempted to give it a seven. I think I'm gonna just stick with a six right now. This was another bottle that's a little inconsistent for me. Um, I've talked about some of those, uh, that Craig Gallicky, uh 19, a little bit inconsistent, never really kind of got my full, my brain fully wrapped around it. This one, maybe not to that degree, but there have been a couple nights where I think this was at, was probably a seven for sure. Maybe more often than not, it was more of a six, which is uh, above average. Real quick on value, I paid $50 for this. I think probably whatever ends up in these bottles and put this on the shelf is probably 50 bucks, which is pretty expensive for a 375 milliliter bottle. There's no getting around that, but it's cast strength. It is seven years old and smaller bottles are always gonna be a little less value oriented. Uh, it's just the bottles cost more to make and just the costs around every bottle is a little higher. So 50 bucks, it's an in, it was an interesting experiment. I, we've tried a couple different ones of these. I think I still have one more. I think I have a fortified wine. I don't remember if it's, I think it specifies again in the, in the tag, but definitely worth the $50, especially if you're curious about the direction that American single malt could go. So really there's two styles of American single malts, at least in my brain. Uh, one is more of a Scottish style and they're basically doing what a lot of other countries are doing around the world. And that is they're, they're making something akin to scotch. Uh, the other side of things is what Stranahan's usually does. And that's aging their whiskey in new heavily charred oak barrels. So it's kind of this cross between the traditional single malt and then American whiskey and in, in like the new heavily charred barrels kind of coming together. Generally speaking, I think the new Charred barrels are probably what's going to catch on here. You're talking a little bit more bold flavors. The bourbon drinkers are are going to be a little bit more drawn to that, more likely. But many of them have already decided that they're not huge fans of scotch, and they're just getting used to the malt flavors by the, by itself is probably enough. Uh, where that extra barrel impact might help with the process of transition. However, I would say that if you like American single malt, and the more you drink it, the more you probably will have an easier time transitioning to a scotch or even a Japanese whiskey or any other country's whiskey that makes it in the style of scotch. The other big thing at play here is a type of, of still. Uh, Stranahan's has some interesting stills. They have 
basically a pot still with a column still as the neck. So you're getting a little bit benefits of both. They have two sets of still. I should be putting pictures up now, hopefully. And um, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. Depending on the type of distillery, they may have just straight pot stills. They may be making it in continuous stills or column stills, just like bourbon and rye usually are. It really is gonna depend on the distillery and it contributes to the wide variety of American single malts that are becoming more and more available every day. So since the beginning of kind of American whiskey, whiskey makers have always been allowed to pretty much make whatever they want. There are certain rules about what they can call it. That's really where you get into the bourbon whiskeys, rye whiskeys, wheat whiskeys, malt whiskeys, which are not American single malts, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And there's just been this big bucket of American whiskey that kind of everything else gets tossed into. Just for the record, American single malt is still not officially a category of whiskey yet. Uh, it has been proposed, and I believe it's been expected that this will become law essentially pretty soon, but it hasn't been passed quite yet. But the proposed rules are, if you're interested, are uh, that American single malts must be made from 100% malted barley, be distilled entirely at one U.S. distillery, be mashed, distilled, and aged in the United States, be distilled to 160 proof or 80% ABV or less, be matured in oak casts that hold no more than 700 liters, so no rule about first fill casts or, or virgin oak casts or however you want to look at it. And allowable coloring, flavoring, and or blending materials are acceptable, but neutral spirits are not permitted. So unfortunately, they have left the door open for flavored American single malt. Flavored whiskey is like a big thing um, among the masses, right? Like apple flavored, vanilla flavored whiskeys, that sort of thing. Um, and they do leave the door open for artificial coloring, which is unusual because generally speaking, that hasn't been allowed in most American categories outside of that American whiskey catch-all category. So it's a little unfortunate. Obviously, this came out of negotiations between a bunch of different people, maybe some of the really big distilleries uh, who could put power behind their proposal, demanded that they be allowed to do these things, and. Hey, I mean, it is what it is at this point, but we should be seeing an American single malt official category coming soon. Before I wrap things up, one other quick, real, just personal anecdote about Stranahan's in particular. Um, realistically, Stranahan's actually has a major place in my overall whiskey journey. See, for many years, I wanted to like whiskey. I tried to like whiskey. I would occasionally buy a bottle here and there. Had some okay experiences, had some nice experiences once in a while but could never really produce that positive experience on a regular basis. Until one year after I moved to California, um, I had a boss who, for Christmas, gifted me a bottle of Stranahan's single malt, just their regular yellow bottle with the, with the bottle with the yellow label on it and everything. Um, we had apparently had some discussion prior where he got it into his head that I was a whiskey guy. Now, that's not super shocking. I did have some whiskeys on the shelf. I had some glasses. I'm sure I probably talked about it a little bit. I liked whiskey cocktails, that sort of thing. But anyways, he gifted me this bottle of Stranahan's for Christmas. And I remember opening it, taking a sip and saying, oh, that really tastes good. And that kept happening. Every time I would pour it, I actually really enjoyed drinking it neat right out of a glass. Glencairn, Tumbler, whatever. And back then, I would have said that it tasted like liquid caramel with some booze in it and wouldn't probably describe that whiskey that way today. But uh, that was the first bottle that I ever owned that I legitimately liked pouring a glass and taking sips of it neat. This was before I really knew how to drink it or how to nose things or anything like that. It was really just pour it in a glass, take a sip like any other drink, and it tasted great. I really liked it and it really got my attention peaked. That kind of led into another bottle that he got me, which was E.H. Taylor Small Batch, which is like probably the next year for Christmas after I told him how much I liked the Stranahan's. Probably bought another bottle for my own self. Uh, had some friends introduce me to Hibiki Harmony and there was a couple others along the way. And then that faithful October in 2019 where I watched those Whiskey Vault videos with the Modern Rogue and never looked back. 
So I can say that American Single Malt was the first whiskey that I ever owned that I truly, honestly enjoyed drinking. And who knows? Maybe things would have been delayed a little bit longer. Maybe they never would have happened if it wasn't really for that bottle. So Stranahan's will always have a really special place in my heart. And you probably see another review of theirs on this channel here and there. Uh, so not going to be an American single malt channel. Don't worry about that. But we will be reviewing a few other off the beaten path, non-scotch distilleries and whiskeys uh, in the coming months just to keep things fresh and to broaden the conversation just a little bit. So thank you everybody for watching. I do really, really appreciate it. Please leave a comment, like, and if you haven't already, please subscribe for more content. We're going to be trying a bunch of different things this summer just to continue to expand uh, my repertoire, get practice doing a few new things, and uh, yeah, just getting ready for next year's whiskey season starting in, say, September-ish, somewhere in there, and hit the ground running and tackle uh, all of the fun new whiskeys that will probably be coming out right around that time. and. Yeah, I think that's probably it for this episode. So my glass is empty. Not good luck to toast with an empty glass. So no toast today. But thank you again for watching. And until next time, take care. <laughs>